Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting. Connecting new money with old money since 2018. And by Change Now, a limitless crypto exchange. Cake Wallet, Sweetwater Digital, and Change Now are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. And supporting us is easier than ever by typing in monerotalk.crypto in your cake wallet send address field to send us a tip. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Ethan Liu, a reporter, author, and early crypto adopter. Ethan's writings on crypto have been featured in publications such as The Guardian, The Washington Post, and Reuters. Ethan reached out to Monero Talk to help get the word out on his latest book, Once a Bitcoin Miner, Scandal and Turmoil in the Cryptocurrency Wild West, where he details his adventures in crypto. From buying his first crypto in 2013 to winding up in North Korea alongside Virgil Griffith, who recently pleaded guilty to a conspiracy charge in the North Korean sanctions case against him. The two also discuss how Monero was the first coin he mined because of its low barrier to entry and how the development of China's CBDC is revealing the need for a true digital cash like Monero. Monero Talk starts now. Okay. Ethan. Hello. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. So your publicist reached out to me and she mentioned your book. And I had no idea about this book until your publicist reached out to me, which I guess your book is literally just launching uh, this week, right? Is it is it actually public yet? Oh, no, it's, it's actually next week, uh, next Tuesday. Yep. Okay. So I, I appreciate that she decided to reach out to Monero Talk. What, what was the impetus behind that? Why, you know, how, uh, how she's picking and choosing people to reach out to? Oh, I have no idea. I, uh, I, I try not to involve myself too much on that side of things, but I did tell her that crypto media is, is very important. Okay. Yeah. So I was I was I was uh, surprised by that that she that she chose us because uh, it's not exactly Monero related, but we'll we'll try to tie it back to Monero in some way. I'm sure. Um, do you want to briefly describe what the book is about? Yeah, so uh, it it follows the uh, adventures of uh, an early investor in crypto, and I know early is a very subjective term, but so I, I got in at, at around 2013. And I hung out with uh, one of the Ethereum co-founders, uh, uh, maybe not hang out, but I, I met him uh, a little before Ethereum was founded. And among the highlights of the book, I somehow ended up in North Korea with uh, the, the man who recently pleaded guilty to charges that arose from the trip, Virgil Griffith. And uh, so basically it's, uh, it's a story about crypto, but told from the lens of the human condition. It's, uh, non-fiction, but character and plot driven. Yeah. So I didn't have an opportunity to read the whole thing, but I was trying to go through it as, as quickly as possible this morning. And I got to say, I was engaged. I was engaged mostly because I experienced a lot of these things myself. I think we, we essentially got into crypto around the same time. It sounds like we even bought our first coin. I, you mentioned Christmas, Christmas day, I think is when you bought, I guess that was 2013, I assume. Like 2013 Christmas? Oh, not Christmas Day. I think it, it was the last day of the year. So it's it's close to New Year. It's like the the very last day of the year. Yeah. So around the same time, and uh, it's, and then you you kind of 
interweave all the events that were going on in crypto as you talk about your own personal experience with it. So it was fun as far as I got, just kind of reliving some of those events, uh, Mount Gox, uh, things like that. Um, so how, how did you get into crypto? You want to ex explain that a little bit? You want to go through that? Oh, yeah. And I, I think everyone has one of these stories, how, how they got into it. And for me, it was uh, just wandering onto the dark web in uh, 2012, 2013, around that time. And I feel this happens for everyone as well. It takes a while from when you first hear about, uh, most people first hear about Bitcoin, when you first hear about it to, to when you take the plunge. So for me, that was, uh, that was about a whole year almost. And so that it started with the dark web and then I, so I, I'm a journalist by trade. So I write uh, a column at this Canadian newspaper here called the financial post. And back then I was interning at this little newspaper on the East coast and I was writing a Bitcoin story. I, I was looking for someone to interview and that man happened to be Anthony Diorio. And so that conversation, uh, that, that was probably something that uh, it was one of the factors and, and. Anthony Diorio, he made a price prediction when he talked to me. And I know lots of people are leery about making price predictions because, you know, uh, like remember Tom Lee, uh, he, lots of people just end up on the wrong side of history, but Anthony Diorio's price prediction was correct. And yeah, partly because of that, that was how I took the plunge. So you, you got pulled in by the price. I think a lot of people uh, fell victim to that, right? The, the number go up. <laughs> The drop yeah. number go up and, and you detail it in your book, how you um, kind of had your highs and lows because 2013, end of 2013 was, you know, a, um, a peak at that point. I think Bitcoin hit like a thousand bucks or 1300 bucks. And then it proceeded to, to go down for, I think, I guess it was the next two years, right? Before it hit, hit bottom, Mount Gox being one of the factors that helped pull it down. Uh, and you describe, I guess, your your feelings along along the way there. <laughs> and you state you stayed in crypto, right? You didn't yeah. uh, you didn't run away. Um, I guess there were moments where you were a little off put, right? Where you're thinking, "Oh my God, I made a horrible mistake." Were you were you excited about the technology then, though? Because I mean, for me, uh, when, when Bitcoin, because like I said, around the same time when I got in, uh, when it proceeded to go down, I. I I eventually got excited about it because at some point I had re really thought, you know, grasped the technology. At least I thought I had to the point where I was like, wow, this is amazing. And uh, I guess the further it goes down, the better because I, I can grab some. Uh, did you have those thoughts as well? Did you feel like it was inevitable? It was just a matter of time until it came back. What was your feeling like during those times watching the price go down after you first got in? Oh, well, I was feeling lots of things. So it was, a, it was a combination of many things. And yeah, uh, almost right after I bought, that was when it started falling. And I think whatever I put into my initial investment just got cut in half. And for a while I was thinking like, well, what, what the hell was I doing? Just listening to Anthony Diorio, but, uh, he, he turned out to be correct. And also I, I think the conversation about technology and price, it, uh, it doesn't have to be separate. It's not one or the other, because uh, I think at first, and I'm not saying I felt this feeling very strongly. And, uh, you know, when we all, when we come into this, I think the level of knowledge, it's, it's not that much, but I did feel that uh, from looking at how crypto Bitcoin was the medium of transaction on the dark web. And why, why was it so? Because it's a purely user to user form of interaction. You know, you're, if you, if you practice good security, your, your funds can't be frozen. Third parties can't access it. And you have a sort of freedom that you have that you don't normally have in our world. And I, I did see a, a certain value in that. Yeah. So do you, do you still see it value? You still, still seeing that's where the value stems from, from that peer to peer aspect, that ability to, to transfer without censorship. Is that what you think? kind of see as being the, the invention here with crypto? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think all other uses of, of crypto, you know, 
Bitcoin does what it does for money and and Ethereum, it tries to do what Bitcoin did for money, but to the wider internet. And that is built on the same underlying principle. And and I know lots of people hate Ethereum, that uh, it does have its share of problems. But I think at the heart of it, that central idea is that uh, what we do, it should be between user and user. And there shouldn't be this uh, central overlord just having all our information and being unaccountable. And you know, when we don't have rights in the digital realm. Yeah, and it's, it's such a disruptive technology at its core. It was literally built to disrupt, right? It was built to disrupt uh, the, the centralized banking system. Uh, it was built to disrupt the ability of governments to, to print money endlessly, so to create some kind of competing form of currency that isn't controlled by any state or corporation. So at its very core, it's disruptive. And uh, you went down that road rather quickly and to a degree that most don't is and you literally ended up in north korea with somebody who i guess recently uh was convicted of essentially uh, well what was the crime exactly that he was convicted of i mean he was i guess allegedly or not allegedly he was convicted at this point of of educating the north korean government and i guess the idea being he was helping them learn about how to get around sanctions by using cryptocurrency. So you, you've seen its disruptive nature uh, in a very real form. How would you describe that experience? And I, I have a lot of questions here, but go ahead and, and, and start to talk about this. This is obviously the meat of the story. You ending up in North Korea, uh, being alongside somebody who is a real expert in crypto right? He's an Ethereum researcher, uh, and he was convicted of essentially teaching the North Koreans how to evade sanctions. So why don't you go ahead and, and tell your side of that story? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so to backtrack a little, so North Korea, uh, it has lots of human rights issues and it pursues all these, uh, nuclear weapons and uh, against the will of the wider world. And so, it's subject to lots of sanctions and it can't conduct you can can't conduct trade with the outside world to a to a, to the same degree as others and so it's very poor and crypto is kind of theoretically a way to to cut at the heart of those sanctions because it's outside the traditional financial system and so north korea it's been uh, lots of reports of north korea doing all sorts of shady stuff with crypto and so I was reading all of those and I was, I'm endlessly fascinated by this. So when they announced a uh, cryptocurrency conference, uh, I was very intrigued and I thought this was a golden opportunity to, uh, to see for myself what North Korea was up to in, in this respect. And so, so that was the thought that was why I went and that turned out to be completely the uh, like what happened there was completely the opposite of my expectations and and also i just completely did not expect the event to make the news in any way so so uh, virgil he did speak at the conference he he never disputed that and in fact he was very open about having gone there about having spoken there um but that day uh, i think it was thanksgiving when we found out the news 2019 that was that was an absolute shock And so you went there as a reporter, essentially? Oh, no, I, I was going there in my personal capacity because uh, I'm a, I invest in crypto and I, I hold quite a bit of crypto and I just, I'm very personally interested in this. And yeah, I, I, so the defense has been saying that what Virgil did, he, uh, all that was discussed at the conference, it was just publicly available information. You know, it's yeah. stuff you can read on a Wikipedia page and, and having been there, I tend to agree with that. So I, I did not think that was spectacular in any way. And in fact, I was a little disappointed. Yeah, it's, it's all very bizarre. What, what's, your, what's your take on that? I mean, how, how do you feel about this? Obviously, you know, we, we, we don't want to be helping out North Korea. Um, you know, the, what's going on in that? Nobody knows what's going on in that country. We know we know a lot of people are are lacking in in rights over there and it's it's 
you know, it's, it's, it's a completely backwards country that we, we hope will one day evolve into something more mar- modern. And we're, we're trying to, I guess, bring them along by putting pressure on them. Uh, and that's where the sanctions come in. Um, but at the same time, it's technology that's going to bring them forward, especially liberating technology like the internet and cryptocurrency. So, well, I mean, what's your take on that? So he was there, he, he's teaching them about this. Obviously he, he's, he's blatantly breaking, breaking the law, uh, some serious laws at this time, but I mean, ethically, did, was he, do you think he was doing the wrong thing by being there? What, what, what's your feeling on that? So ethically, I don't think he's doing the wrong thing by being there because I don't think he actually ended up helping North Korea in any way because the what was discussed at the conference, it was just really quite surface level uh, information. And I, I know the government is uh, uh, characterizing that as uh, high level technical information. And uh, I don't think those definitions are mutually exclusive. You know, it's... It can be high level, um, you know, that's a word without a subjective, uh, that's a subjective word without an objective definition. And so, and you, what you see on Wikipedia, uh, can you label that as highly technical? Sure. But uh, at the end of the day, um, I don't think he went there with the intention of helping them to do, do anything. He. He just went there and gave a talk, and I think the whole nature of the trip, we we weren't even interacting with uh, the technical people from North Korea, and that's one of the things that that was unexpected for me. I thought uh, I'd get to hear from their experts, but it, the like, for example, our North Korean minders, they were just uh, uh, they were from the cultural side. The the past. Uh, jobs, they included uh, chaperoning foreign journalists. So it was more of a, like a dog and pony show. It was a glorified tourism tour trip. Yeah. Um, but uh, ultimately, you know, what you said was correct, that uh, uh, North Korea is an issue to the world. And so I, I think what the government is doing, it's not so much about what Virgil specifically did, but about what it, what it symbolizes. They, they don't want other people to do the same thing and he's and he broke the letter of the law and he's clearly being made an example of yeah it's it's wild but like i said it is it's when you think about it it is it's it's a difficult one when you when you try to put on the the ethical lens and look at it obviously i mean he wasn't there you know if he was there just teaching regular people then i guess there would even be a you know much more of an argument that he he's you know, doing the right thing by bringing this technology to the to this country that's lacking in, in these types of technologies. But he was, you know, talking to the state leaders. Uh, not like I don't think anybody would even have the ability of going into this country and just approaching the people, right? I mean, yeah. So, um, wait, uh, just a correction. I don't think he was talking to the state leaders because we don't really know who the audience at the at the conference was. We okay. were like uh, we were like just show ponies. You know, we were whisked in. The talk happened and then, then we were whisked out. We never had any one-on-one interaction with them. And I have pictures of North Koreans literally just falling asleep during the talk. And I, yeah, I, I have no idea who those people are. You know, they say they're from the government, but you know, in North Korea, everyone works for the government. Right. Anybody that's interacting with the outside world is working with the government, right? No, I mean, they, they don't have private enterprise. So like every single person in some way, you're working for the government. Right, right. Um, so when, when you were there, um, is there anything else you could tell us about that scene? I mean, this is just so wild. Learning about North Korea from firsthand is wild. So, But the, the fact that you were there for was what was a crypto conference. Any other details you could t- tell us about? Kind of paint the picture? Mm-hmm. So, uh, Virgil, I think he was the only one among, there were eight foreigners, so he was the only one among us who was uh, an actual crypto expert big shot. And I think he was the the one person who went in knowing that he was going to be a speaker, going to give a speech. Uh, the rest of us, we, were, we, we went there as, simply as passive participants, you know, we thought we were going to listen to the North Koreans. And... 
on the first day, we were told that, uh, in fact, uh, you are the you are the conference. You're supposed to present to the Koreans, and that that, that was very unexpected. And I eventually declined to present, but uh, everyone else who spoke at the conference, more or less, uh, they 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 just completely made up everything uh, just a few days beforehand. Were they talking about any other cryptos in particular? So obviously, uh, Virgil went up, he gave his talk. Were there other talks that were given by other people? Yes, yeah, yes, there were. Uh, but I, I wouldn't go into, into too many details because uh, not everyone has publicly said that they have gone to North Korea and it's understandably a, a sensitive matter. And I, I wouldn't go too much into what Virgil said as well because he is... He's still due to be sentenced, and the the sentence the judge isn't bound by the plea deal, so it could be anything, and I, I don't want to affect that. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, yeah, we don't want to be getting people in trouble here or spreading false information. Uh, but were other cryptos discussed there, or was it just Ethereum? Oh, I, I think everything under the sun was uh, discussed. It was like Crypto One Hundred One, but you know there was. Uh, there was no depth. It was just, it was quite broad. And yeah, uh, other cryptos were discussed. Mm. So given that all this happened to you um, and you've, you know, experienced these things firsthand, how has that affected your opinion of the crypto space? I mean, you still have the, the same thoughts about Bitcoin and crypto before this incident and after, or, or has your opinion changed? Mm -hmm. uh, well, if you read what uh, some people wrote about Virgil recently, there was someone on Decrypt who said that, I think he talked to a friend of Virgil's who who said that Virgil viewed life as, as a video game, that he, he's like a character in a video game, just going around having fun. The world's a playground. And I, I think I sort of felt that way before as well and you know the day before we went into north korea so you can only fly from from beijing and maybe a couple of neighboring places because north korea's planes are too old the ban from europe and so uh but when i first met them the first thing one guy said to me was uh, what made you decide to do this crazy thing of going to north korea and i said uh, well what about you and then we all laughed, and I, I think uh, we 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 all shared something, some uh, adventurous nature. And I, I think I did feel like how Virgil felt that this uh, this Wild West was was it was quite fun. But uh, seeing Virgil's arrest, it was, it was quite a sobering moment for me. And definitely see, uh, seeing him in court, be guilty to everything. So. Um, I think definitely after everything, I, I view everything with uh, with definitely more of a seriousness. Yeah. So how is so now, now ex explain that a little bit more? So like we said, you know, crypto is supposed to be disruptive, right? Uh, it's, it's literally you know what it's what it's setting out to do. So you're saying now you're thinking about more about what those repercussions actually are terms of how it's disrupting things and is it changing your viewpoint as to whether or not all those disruptions are actually good i don't think it's changing it in in that respect where whether ultimately i feel disruptions are good or not i think of course disruptions are good uh, how how we evolve how society progresses how history is made it's it's always through disruption but I, I guess, uh, you know, processing it more on a personal level, I just think I, it's just made me all the more cautious of everything because, uh, you know, um, maybe it could have been me uh, arrested and facing six and a half years. You know, uh, circumstances are vastly different, but, you know, seeing Virgil arrested clearly made me think about myself. And also in the book, I, I write about, uh, I, I was on this uh, crypto gathering, this place on a Thai island where people, I guess, people hung out with, without a care. And there was a, 
there's a guy I saw pre Thailand and a guy I saw afterward, and he broke his back because uh, he got hit by a motorcycle, and like that guy could easily have been me. Um, so yeah, I think uh, crypto it's uh, it's a fun place, it's disruptive, but also I think lots of people they they don't find what they seek there. Yeah, it's the wild west comes with its you know its pros and its cons. It's, it's called an adventure for a reason. Um, so do you do you think society is kind of getting used to the disruptive nature of crypto and it's um, not as becoming less shocking? I mean, this this story was I think a pretty shocking one, and we've seen a lot of others, and a lot of them are actually Monero related. Um, you know, one of the stories was that that North Korea was mining Monero. That was uh, a, a big story at the time. I don't know if you if you followed that one, um, but just a lot of other you know ransomware hacking, and they're asking for their ransoms in Monero. They give a twenty percent discount if ransoms are paid in Monero. So we're seeing ransomware hackers move towards it. Uh, the dark dark markets, like you said, that was kind of your introduction into seeing what the the real or the first use case of crypto was, and uh, we're seeing Monero take over that space and being used in, in dark markets. Um, so a, a lot of people that are in the Monero world uh, are dealing with this now on a daily basis of seeing, you know, uh, crypto's disruptive nature firsthand and in ways that may may not be ethically positive. Do you think overall society is going to come to terms with that or it's just going to keep getting worse and worse and there's going to be a fight against crypto because of these things that it can do or that we're going to start to see it more as a tool and like the internet and that that will eventually be what what overcomes? Hmm. Well, I, I don't think it has to be either or. I, I think uh, crypto is a very big and diverse place and it's branching into lots of different directions. And, but I, I think with respect to, to coins like Monero, because uh, a while ago I did read that uh, the NSA, they were hiring people to try to break Monero. And, and I, I, I am sure they, they are continuing, continuing to do that. Um, and so, you know, they say for, for any action, there's going to be an equal and opposite reaction. I think for that aspect of the crypto space, there is definitely going to be a continued pushback. But I think for other aspects, you know, you like, for example, central bank digital currencies, and you know, they're not really a crypto thing, but they're kind of inspired by them. And I think there's going to be more of an embrace on that aspect by the mainstream world. So, and I think ultimately, like different branches of the crypto world, they're going to branch off into, into different places. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Because you recently wrote an article, I think, saying uh, crypto's wild and defiant days are coming to an end uh, mm -hmm. because of the, you know, the, the North Korean event. So I guess that's what I was trying to get at. Do you kind of see things peaking out? So, you know, we're seeing some of these events, some of these Monero related. The most recent one is you had uh, these U.S. nuclear engineers, a husband and wife that were selling these secrets to what they thought was another state, which ended up being the FBI. And the FBI was paying them in Monero for the information because they had requested Monero. So yet just another example of, you know, the more nefarious use cases being showcased for digital cash. But do you see this kind of peaking out? Is that what you were trying to say in that article that the, um, you know, the defiant, you said the defiant days are coming to an end. So yeah, what, what did you mean by that? I thought that was an interesting statement to be made. Yeah, so yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I do feel that way, but I don't mean that there are going to be no more crypto crimes or that, uh, you know, that the, the, the industry is going to find uh, eternal peace with regulators. Um, and I think that the, the, the case that, that you, that you raise, it's it's a good example of that, because uh, that that's not really a crypto case, and that's a case that happens to involve crypto, and it's kind of and uh, the the guy I feel like he he did have a lot of high operational security, but ultimately it seems like a bit of an amateur thing, and I think 
it used to be in the past where these crypto crimes, they, they seem to symbolize crypto in a way, like when Ross Albrecht got caught or, or the case of Charlie Shrem, like that was, uh, that was seen as a case involving crypto, but I think more and more, uh, these high profile cases involving really high profile crypto people and doing really stupid things and, uh, seeing seeming to symbolize crypto, uh, that's going to be a thing of the past. And in the future, um, we will still have crypto crimes, but they're going to be, uh, by people like these or like, uh, Ian Freeman, for example. And, uh, I know, I guess people in the crypto world, they have heard of him, but people outside the crypto world, they're going to be like, who's Ian Freeman. Um, and I think that that's the way it's, it's going to go. It's just that these, these crypto crimes, they're, they're going to be, uh, less prominent mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're, they're going to be like leveled out, you know, they're going to be more mainstream to the extent that uh, people think of them as normal crimes that happen to involve crypto. If that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Do you think the average Joe is going to start to look at it the way we do in terms of, Oh, if they're, if they're using, you know, a certain cryptocurrency for that, that might mean that cryptocurrency is doing something unique, you know? So we, we often talk about that in, in Monero land. Okay. So they're using it for, you know, getting the ransoms. Uh, people are using it uh, on the dark market as digital cash. Uh, so does that mean, you know, that Monero is perhaps doing something um, that other cryptos can't do? And do you think the general public will start to pick up on that and see it in that way as well? Oh, I think absolutely not. I, I don't, I don't think the general public sees a lot of difference between Monero and other coins. And I think to them, uh, yeah, everything is crypto and Bitcoin. I think most people, they still use Bitcoin to refer to everything. And, uh, when, when, well, when they see like, uh, I think most people still think Bitcoin's untraceable or something like, uh, remember Nancy Pelosi saying, uh, uh, calling what the, the, Bitcoin developers or crypto developers, shady coders or something. And I, I think it's going to be a while bef before that hurdle is crossed. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I do think events like these though, might start to highlight that a bit more. Uh, maybe people will start to pick up on it, but it, it, it is, it blows my mind that it's taking so long for people to realize this. When did you first come to that realization? Like I said, you know, I started off similar time you did, um, went down the Bitcoin rabbit hole was a, a BTC maxi. But for me, uh -huh. that turning point was when I realized Bitcoin was traceable that I started to look at Monero because I, I, I really think that's one of the, the vital pillars of, of a cryptocurrency is having something that's, you know, fungible and private. Um, so did you go down a similar, uh, path or not necessarily? Not necessarily. I, I don't think I was ever uh, a, a Bitcoin maxi. I, I do think that during 2017, when we had the ICO hype, I think uh, back then, I think like 90% of all the, all the coins are shit coins, but I, I've, I don't think I've ever been a, a complete Bitcoin maxi. Um, but was there that aha moment? Like, wait a minute, Bitcoin is transparent. Cause I mean, it took me some time to realize that, like we're saying it's taking the general public, but uh, even when you were looking at it closely, especially in the early days, uh, cause in the early days, you know, you, all right, maybe when you started using your first block explorer, you know, maybe that's kind of opened your eyes to, but was, was there a moment for you when you're like, wait a minute, this, this isn't anonymous digital cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I ever thought of it as anonymous because I remember during my first interview with uh, Anthony Diorio that that's what he said. Everything is out and in the open. Uh, but when you talk about privacy, I think uh, one thing that's perhaps made me think more about this issue is uh, the central bank digital currency and especially what China is doing. And I, I think we're going to we're going to get to a world one day where everyone in China just uses the central bank digital currency. And that is like the, the extreme opposite of Monero and everything is so traceable and that, that, and you know, the whole issue of China state surveillance, that's something that uh, unnerves me a little. And I think, yeah, um, for me, maybe that, that is the, the issue. 
yeah, if, if Monero didn't exist, I'd be terrified right now. Um, you know, like, luckily the, you know, the, the positive aspects of the technology do in fact exist. And hopefully when central bank digital currencies become a thing, uh, it will maybe just, you know, fingers crossed become on ramps to these more pure cryptos is, is my hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh that, that, that's a good way to look at it. You know, I think when, when people start using their, the central bank coins, uh, yeah, probably makes other cryptos more palatable. So what interests you right now? I mean, so, you know, the North Korea thing, that sounds like that came out of nowhere. You're like, you know what, let me, let me, let me jump on this plane. I want to go check out this, this conference, wild, a wild adventure, uh, certainly controversial. Um, what's, what's the next jump on the plane and head to North Korea moment for you? What's, 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 what interests you right now? What do you, what do you want to go see firsthand? What are you most interested in, in crypto? Uh huh. Well, I, uh, I, I think what, one of my, uh, re regret is not going to, to, to that huge Bitcoin conference last year, because in, in Miami, that was the, I think that was when that was the first crypto event after the pandemic so during the pandemic so many things got things got canceled people stayed where they were and like that was uh, kind of like opening the tap you know unleashing everything and that was a big event lots of friends who went there but i i i missed out on that one and yeah i uh, and you know uh conferences are a big thing in crypto and there's this joke that uh, you know to to make money in crypto the thing you should do is to is to host a conference and i went to so many of them i went to a lot of meetups i met lots of people and i i, I love those events and i haven't gone to one in i think like two maybe maybe up to two years so yeah i, I want to go to one of them awesome man. yeah we were we were down in miami uh and uh -huh. the, the 2022 one is coming up fast because it's going to be in april this year uh -huh. um so Maybe I'll see you over there. And actually, I guess I might as well mention it here on this show. Um, so we're thinking of throwing a Monero. So our other show is called Monero Topia. We have Monero Talk, where I kind of do these long form interviews. And then we have another show called Monero Topia, where the community can join in. Anybody can join in on the conversation. And we just talk about, you know, what's going on in Monero. And we talk about these, these idealistic uh, thoughts about Monero and how you can opt into it and, you know, um, li live off of anonymous digital currency. Uh, so we're thinking of maybe throwing a Monero Topia event. And, uh, originally we were going to try to do it in Puerto Rico, but now we're thinking of maybe even doing it side by side, the Miami Bitcoin conference, doing it somewhere nearby, maybe just a day or a half a day, uh, and try to pull in some of the Bitcoiners. I guess those that aren't too <laughs> uh, that are interested in privacy and interested in this idea of opting out into a Monero Topia. So maybe we would, uh, maybe we'll see you over there. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. That is uh, definitely something I'm considering. So th th there is this other issue that I, uh, I don't like getting sticks shoved up my nose. So I, I don't like doing the whole pre-departure testing thing for travel, but it looks like for vaccinated people, the U S is going to get rid of that if you come from Canada soon. So I'm, I'm hoping that happens. Yes. And, uh, Florida is probably the, the most, um, uh, you know, anti vax mandate other than Texas in the U S so it's hopefully things will work out there and yeah, we won't be shoving things up our noses, uh, to, to come to the conference. I agree with you there. I think it's, I think we were kind of beyond that point and we're ready to get back to normal. We, we, we don't need to go into that. <laughs> So any, anything else we could talk about with regards to Monero? I mean, it's, it's you were in crypto pretty early. Um, you were mining, you were mining early. Did you have any firsthand interactions with Monero from the early days? You said you were, you were on the dark markets at some point. Um, what were your, kind of your, your firsthand experiences with Monero? Well, that was the first coin I ever mined. Because, uh, and that's one thing I like about Monero that, uh, you, it, you can mine it with your, with your PC, with your CPU. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I use my employer's computers to mine Monero. 
And th th that, that was a thing I did 2017. So I, I had a lot of fun with that. That was my, my introduction into mining because I think back then that was, that was when to, to mine, I think any other like bigger coin, you had to have like specialized equipment. So when I first started, it was, I didn't have all that. So uh, Monero was what I turned to. Very cool. Yeah, I don't know if you know, but Monero has managed to maintain its ASIC resistance. Uh, and it invented something. Uh, well, it didn't. It was invented by members in the community, one of them being Howard Chu. And it's called Random X. And it's basically a, a, a new proof of work system that effectively turns the CPU into the ASIC of Monero. So the most efficient way to, to mine Monero is with the CPU. Uh huh. That, that's very neat, and and you know, like uh, I, I know, like uh, Ethereum. Okay, I guess it's moved on to, to proof of stake. But there was a point when Bitmain rolled out uh, ASICs for for Ether, and and I think I, I know when when Vitalik made Ethereum, he he wanted it to be ASIC resistant to uh, so that it's more democratic. And but I guess ultimately that didn't work out. But yeah, so it's a very good thing that it's still that way with Monero. Yeah, that's kind of one of its core, you know, positions that we want to keep the network as decentralized as possible. Uh, I'm sure you saw when they banned crypto recently in China and they banned mining that the uh, Bitcoin mining network essentially crashed in terms uh, in terms of hash power has since uh, climbing back up. But it was quite evident that, uh, you know, a a state is capable of influencing the Bitcoin mining network by shutting down mining. Uh, with with Monero, it arguably wouldn't be as easy, right? Because the miners aren't as centralized. They're not in warehouses controlled by corporations that could be easily uh, manipulated by governments. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting you brought up the whole China thing. I, I found that very interesting, like uh, China's opposition toward crypto because I like maybe I saw it coming now but like maybe two years ago I would have never seen that coming I would have thought China would want to, to try to control Bitcoin maybe it wants to lure all the miners to go to China and you know and then try to control that in some way perhaps but they totally went in the opposite direction and uh, yeah it, it kind of befuddles me well, what do you think yeah, I was thinking along the same lines, right? And uh, it was more of a threat to Bitcoin when there was this belief that, like you said, China might control a large percentage of the mining network and eventually, you know, could potentially censor transactions. But instead, they took the opposite approach and completely kicked the protocol out of their country. I don't know what to think. Uh, you know, like we we're saying with the CBDCs, so maybe because they're ready to launch their central bank digital currency. They didn't want uh, Bitcoin competing there. I, I don't really know what their long-term play is. Um, I guess they could always get back into the Bitcoin mining game at some point. Uh, maybe they just thought that game theory wise, um, they would be, they didn't want to help the Bitcoin network grow any larger and become any more robust than it already is. So they thought the best way to, to hurt it is to just not participate in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Right. And that's uh, that, that actually makes it, I feel e even more scary that they, they're putting everything on their, on their central bank digital currency. And I, I really, and you know, China is already quite heavily surveilled even even without uh, the, the the digital currency so i really hate to see a world where you know that becomes like the thing people use day to day yeah we talk about that on the, we've talked about on the show a few times with different guests do you think countries like china will the citizens of those countries will open their eyes to cryptos like monero so obviously you know they 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 banned crypto and they made it difficult to, to mine Bitcoin, but something like Monero, which is a little more, you know, subversive, um, you know, like we said, you can mine it with a CPU. So anybody who has access to the internet could essentially get their hands on some Monero with probably without being detected. 
and then they can send it around without being tracked and traced on a blockchain. Do you think citizens of, of China will come to realize that and find interest in that or hmm. they won't really care to, to move in that direction? Hmm. Uh, sadly, I don't think so. And so I, I was born in China and uh, I, I have a family friend. So I was talking with him recently and he said, do you have any Chinese friends? And I was like, of course, I have lots of Chinese friends. And he was like, no, no, I mean, uh, Chinese who are from China and someone who's re who spent their whole life there. And, and I was like, huh, actually very few. And he was like, good, don't talk to them. And so that's a bit of a biased view, but uh, I, I think lots of people, if you're, if you spend your whole life in China, they have a censored internet and, and it's actually becoming increasingly worse uh, how the government controls the cultural sphere. So I think you grow up with a completely different worldview from someone outside. And, and I think definitely individual Chinese people, they're, 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 they might take a liking to Monero, they might discover, uh, you know, coins with privacy in them. But I, I think as a whole, if you want to talk about the collective, if you want to talk about the majority of the people, um, I, I think they're drinking the government's Kool-Aid. And, and one reason for that is, uh, and maybe this is tapering off now, but China has been on a great economic rise. And, you know, when you look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, China has just fulfilled like the, this basic sustenance and everything. People are getting middle-class lives. And I don't think as a collective, they're thinking that much about higher ideals. Mm, they're, they're kind of fat and happy, or, or at least happy. And so you're saying uh, things like, like they're, they're not too concerned about obtaining some idealistic liberty. Is that, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, and I think that's where the country is right now. But I think definitely in the future, there is the potential for that. But it'll be quite a far future. It's very scary, right? It's very scary to see that an entire nation, billions of people, um, are willing or, you know, to, to look the other way at, at, at liberating technologies like this and to, like, for the reasons you said, not be so concerned about them, not really see them as a need. Do you think where maybe we're just deluded here in the, in the West is, is uh, <laughs> this whole Liberty thing, just a, an illusion also, or, you know, I mean, who's right and who's wrong. I know it's kind of a philosophical question, but it's, it's, it's something to, to think about. Right. Yeah. It's uh, I think a lot of things are a matter of perspective. We, definitely don't have it the, 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 the best in the West. You know, we, we have uh, a lot of oppression. We have a lot of uh, inequality and we, and I think for, for many people, the lives here are just as harsh uh, as people in China. But I, I think ultimately, uh, I don't think the system in itself, the ideal is is bad like uh, like like uh, ethereum for example it's it's flawed in many ways but i think the the base idea at the heart of it uh you know the that's something that that we should strive toward definitely definitely so where do you see all this all headed and and is it going to be in your in your next book what what is your next book what's the next thing you're gonna potentially write about or you don't know yet um, actually may maybe something to do with China, but I, yeah, I, I don't know yet. Uh, well, the current book, it's not even out yet. So just, uh, focus on this for now. Very cool, man. And so you were, you were a writer before you got into crypto. Is that correct? Yeah. So I, uh, I did a bunch of internships, but I think, uh, after I graduated university, my first big publication was the Toronto star here in Canada. And then I wrote for Reuters for about two years. And now I write a crypto column in the financial post. You want to tell people where they can learn more about you and get their hands on the book and, you know, follow your other work. Yeah. So, uh, the, the title of the book is, uh, once a Bitcoin miner 
scandal and turmoil in the cryptocurrency wild west and it's available uh, wherever you buy books but i always say this if you hate amazon you can try your local independent bookstore um yeah uh, i personally don't hate amazon with like a with like a 10 maybe mine's like a six or a seven but i know lots of people are 10 so if you're a 10 don't go to amazon and yeah you can google me my last name is spelled l-o-u is there any way to buy the book directly off of you? Say, say with Monero, perhaps? Is that is that enough? Uh -huh. Oh, there, there actually is a way. So, oh, I, I actually have a, a quite a story of how uh, I tried to convince, uh, I tried to find a way so that people can buy the book with crypto. Yeah. And so, no, no bookseller I know is, uh, that takes crypto. And but I know, for example, in Amazon, if you're in the U.S. You can pay with crypto wherever you pay with PayPal. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. On Amazon, you could pay with crypto wherever PayPal is. Uh, certainly possible. Yeah. I, nowadays, I've been using um, like those the cards that you can buy. So coin cards is one, and you could use Monero to buy those, and then you can use those for, you know, for Amazon. Pretty much, you know, all the all the major marketplaces online. You could buy essentially a gift card with Monero and then use that to make your purchases. I know that's one workaround for for using crypto. Oh yeah, but that, that that's not the true way. That's a workaround. I, so I, I was trying to find a way where you can just buy buy directly with crypto. So well, I think the best way would be is if you just directly sell the book, right? Because then it's it's really peer to peer. And people are just buying it off of you with crypto. Or I guess there might be some uh, difficulties there with your publicist or or with how you uh are contracted to sell the book perhaps uh well i i i'm, I'm usually the sort of guy who will uh, ask for forgiveness rather than permission so I, I have actually set that up if you go to my website ethanlu.com you can buy it with crypto but oh so you did do it okay yeah but before that it was a whole ordeal so i at first i, I thought i tried to persuade my publisher mm -hmm. because you know how um how, how book deals are done. Uh, so the, that they're bought by one acquiring editor and that editor uh, ex expressed a, a wide fascination with crypto. So I thought maybe there's someone here who would speak the language, but ultimately that was unsuccessful. And then I bought email lists of every single independent bookstore in like Canada and the US. I sent them like mass emails, like, well, would you consider accepting crypto for this one book? Um, not a single one said yes, but there were people who said, oh, this book is cool, you know, and, the, and, you know, we'll, we'll stock your book, but no, we can't accept crypto. Very, so, very surprised in this, in this day and age, right. Where everybody knows Dogecoin, um, you yeah. would think, uh, people would be coming around. Cause I know I, I've personally convinced quite a few people to accept crypto on the spot. What were you getting any reasons as to why they were saying no? Oh yes, I, I discovered something about the book industry. So all of them use, I think a lot of them use the same point of sales terminal. Mm. Uh, it's like this software thing. So uh, for them to accept crypto, uh, that point of sale software, like they have to accept crypto because you know, these bookstores, they, they report sales, the bestseller list and everything. So they, they don't have their own discretion here for a lot of them. Got it. Got it. Well, that, that will change soon. I mean, I think I'll, I imagine quite a few point of sale softwares are, are tying crypto into into uh, means of payment at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, man. I think uh, I think we covered quite a bit. Anything else you want to bring up before we close it out? Mm -hmm. uh, no, you've been uh, very comprehensive and uh, love the conversation, and uh, I very much appreciate your having me. Yes, thanks for coming on. Uh, like I said, I wasn't expecting to do this show, but your publicist uh, reached out and it looked interesting. And I went through your book; it was very cool. And as long as we got a little Monero in there, which which we actually got quite a bit of Monero in there, so it was it was good discussion. I'm sure the Monero Talk family will will appreciate this conversation. Mm -hmm. All right, man. Thank you. All right, bye. So long. 
Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.